welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atto Quayson and I am a professor of English at Stanford University. This episode will build upon the episode on the airport as Chronoto that we saw a couple of weeks ago. But this time, we'll be discussing the concept of spatial traversal and the means of locomotion in relation to the chronotope of the railway station. This will be illustrated with reference to the Born Ultimatum. It will be shown how the space of London's Waterloo Station is represented in the movie as illustrating a particular kind of spatial logic that is grounded on the spatial morphology of the railway station. The relationship between foreground and background in the scenes from the movie will be examined to establish the various ways in which our sense of space is augmented by the representational protocols deployed in the film including camera movement, the cut between scenes in different locations, and the overall ambience of the railway station in general. At the heart of the discussion will be an illustration of spatial analysis that enlivens space as a critical vector of interpretation on an equal footing with characterization action, and other elements of the filmic representation. One of the central problems we often encounter in literary criticism is how to talk about space without reducing it simply to the background against which the drama of the character's life choices is displayed. In most readings, Space is merely an inert background or conceptual wallpaper and contributes very little to the analysis, unless, of course, it is in the genre of science fiction or fantasy, in which case space becomes central to our understanding of what is most important within the text. In one of the more spatially sensitive accounts of literature, Joseph Frank argues in the idea of spatial form that the foregrounding of spatial form over causal chronological order in narrative texts is an essential phenomenon of modernist avant-garde literature associated with T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and various others of the early 20th century European literary tradition. Frank understands form as what forces a reader to absorb a work both temporally and spatially and to obtain from it a clearer and deeper view of the world. The basic argument of spatial form in modern literature, the most influential essay in Frank's book, which was first published on its own ahead of the volume in 1945, is that modernist literary works are spatial insofar as they replace history and narrative sequence with a sense of mythic simultaneity that disrupts the normal continuities of prose narrative with disjunctive syntactic arrangements. What Frank is arguing here is that space is best seen through the essentially jumpstart devices of unforeseen poetic and narrative juxtapositions, so that the imaginative leaps that are required in, say, following the mind of Leopold Bloom as he traverses through Dublin in Joyce's Ulysses or T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland as he institutes connections between vastly disparate mythical and literary domains, then instigates a special sense on our part 
by way of the requirement for conceptual leaps that we make in trying to make sense of the text. While Frank is entirely correct in seeing modernist juxtaposition as producing spatial forms of cognition, his reading does not accord with other Marxist spatial theorists, such as Henri Lefebvre, David Harvey, Michel Foucault, Doreen Massey, and various others who have maintained that space is simultaneously the symptom and producer of social relations. Whereas Frank is essentially a formalist in his overall critical impulses, the Marxist critics I have just mentioned deploy structural materialist analyses that are amply infused with sociological sensibilities. In other words, for the Marxist spatial theorists, even as abstract a concept as space is structural and relational and can only be fully understood as it divulges the possibilities, shapes, and impediments to human social interaction. Thus for them, the cognitive effects of narrative juxtaposition are not fully spatial until they are simultaneously connected to the social relationality instigated through space. Furthermore, Frank's reading of modernist poetic juxtaposition does not really help us in grasping the cognitive role of chronotopes as they appear in literary writing. As we saw from the episode on the airport a couple of weeks ago, the term chronotope derives from two Greek words and simply means space-time. Following Mikhail Bakhtin's discussion of the concept, we see how a chronotope divulges a configuration of spatial and temporal indices in order to produce a cognitive apparatus for reading both the novel and what lies beyond it in the real world. The cognitive apparatus implied by the chronotopes is more fully social than the poetic juxtapositions Frank writes of. And yet the ways in which spatial and temporal indices are configured also means that different chronotopes divulge different social relations. Thus, the road chronotope is structurally different from the chronotope of the castle, as that one is from the chronotope of the university or the airport, all of which we explored in our previous episode on the airport as chronotope. Furthermore, a chronotope is also primarily a means for displaying different kinds of human interaction so that its spatial and temporal indices also help to frame and indeed inflect the ways in which the human interaction is to be understood within a literary or other artistic representation. What I am interested in here, however, is to introduce the fresh concepts of spatial traversal and means of locomotion to help us interpret the cognitive implications of the chronotopic configurations of spatial and temporal indices. For this, I will be turning to the chronotope of the railway station to be found in the Bourne Ultimatum, which was directed by Paul Greengrass and released in 2007. To start with, spatial traversal in general implies several interrelated conceptual elements. First is the very banal fact that one's relationship to space is quite different when one is walking or riding a horse or a bicycle 
or on a train. Each means of locomotion for spatial traversal imposes a different relationship to the spatial environment one travels through. For example, a bicycle rider in a big city such as, say, Accra, London, or Toronto requires a highly developed ambient sense of other vehicles on the road, pedestrian density, and the infrastructural dispositions of road signs, red lights, crossroads, and other features of cycling in the city. The person walking or in a car requires a different kind of ambient sense of space and its details. And the driver of the car has an even greater different relationship to the road than the one that is simply a passenger being driven around. What is more important in the representation of the means of locomotion and of spatial traversal in literature and film, however, is the degree to which the character either A shows awareness of what is going on around them, B interacts with the social environment in the process of spatial traversal, and C uses stimuli from the external environment to trigger emotional processes and responses inside of their own minds. Even though these three are not mutually exclusive, it is not uncommon for them to be represented separately in various uh, literatures and films. The zero sum of the representation of spatial traversal is where none of the aforementioned features is evident, and the objective is merely to show that the character has been transported from point A to point B. In this case, both the means of locomotion and the spatial traversal are simply used as a convenient conduit for changing the location of the narrative representation. We shall not be paying any atten attention to this zero-sum vector of spatial traversal, except to bear it in mind as a contrast to the other types of re representation we will be looking at. Typically, the change in geographical or spatial location is not void of ethical significance. When the character shifts locations, it is often to demarcate a shift in the ethical character of the different spatial locations. This shift in ethical character of different locations is most evident in works where there is also an implication of stark racial or class distinctions. These impose a challenge to the character's ethical sensibility and what choices they make. Dante's The Divine Comedy is structured entirely as a journey through different ethically charged spatial locations. Important to our discussion of both literature and film, however, is how the specific form of locomotion and of spatial traversal are also represented through specific literary and filmic devices that also raise implications for how we might see them in their correlation to other expressive dimensions of the novel or film in question. I am going to illustrate these various aspects of spatial traversal and means of locomotion, primarily with reference to the scene at Waterloo Station in the Bourne Ultimatum. The Bourne Ultimatum is the third installment in the Jason Bourne film series and is loosely based on a novel of the same name by Robert Ludlum. The plot of the film centers on Jason Bourne's attempt at finding out more about his identity after suffering amnesia following events in the previous film in the series. 
He was a highly trained CIA black ops operative who had fallen off the grid. The section of the film I'm interested in takes place between uh, 20 minutes and 40 seconds and 26 minutes and 37 seconds. It is staged primarily inside a Waterloo station in London where Bourne meets Simon Ross of the Guardian news newspaper and tries to find out from the journalist what information he has on Jason Bourne. Ross had written several investigative pieces on Jason Bourne and the Treadstone program, a secret black, black ops program that was run by the CIA and that had later been discontinued. The scenes from the Waterloo station in which the two men meet are periodically intercut with scenes in a room filled with operatives scrutinizing TV monitors at the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, led by the director Ezra Kramer, whom we later find out is a corrupt official. The operatives have marshaled all cameras in and around Waterloo Station to try and track down Simon Ross, whom they have been following for a while to try and discover who his informant for the various investigative pieces has been. The Waterloo scene escalates in emotional intensity very quickly when the CIA director orders three extraction teams to grab Ross and later an assassin simply to kill him. Ross is entirely oblivious as to the dire threats he is facing and it is left to Jason Bourne to interpret various spatial cues inside Waterloo Station in order to keep the journalists safe and also to evade detection by the CIA, which he knows is scrutinizing every detail through the cameras inside the railway stations from the headquarters in Virginia. The segment thus cuts between the scenes at Waterloo Station and those at the CIA office, with the monitors in the second location acting as a collective fourth eye alongside those of the camera, the eyes of Jason Bourne and Simon Ross inside the railway station, and of course, our own eyes as we get privileged access to all the optical viewpoints within the unfolding scene. The sense of emergency and imminent threat intensifies as the two men, ably directed by Jason Bourne, play a cat and mouse game with the various CIA agents inside of, of the station and convert various banal corners and spaces in the railway station into temporary places of concealment in a rapidly changing scene of dramatic action. The first thing to notice about the scene is the nature of the spatial morphology of the infrastructure inside of Waterloo Station. The Oxford Encyclopedia of Semiotics describes morphology in its online version thus, the study and description of form or structure, especially in biology and linguistics, morphology addresses the developmental and transformational features of systems rather than their static characteristics. Hence, what comes under the rubric of the morphological are irregular, inexact, or changing shapes rather than ideal geometrical forms. While morphology occasionally designates a typology or broad system of classification, more often it implies an attention to individual variation. 
objects as they appear in the real world over and above general categories. When the term is used in humanist disciplines, it has therefore tended to be used with varying degrees of rigor and precision to impose order on not readily formalizable entities such as history and language. The sentence, the boy is going to school, is subject to a lexical and morphological analysis in which the noun phrase, the boy, the verbal phrase, is going, and the subject, to school, all play their part in helping us to make sense of the sentence. However, if we add other grammatical elements to the sentence to turn it into the tall boy in the orange baseball cap was running breathlessly to the school with a painting of Rihanna on the wall, the additions introduce a different inflection to the sentence and thus shifts its original meaning. Translated into a spatial analysis, the concept of spatial morphology means seeing various infrastructural elements and details within space as contributing to the way in which a given space is to be understood and negotiated in human interaction. The elements come together to support a grammar of space. Thus in a house, for example, you're very unlikely to find a bathtub in the kitchen or an oven in the bathroom. They would be considered morphologically inappropriate. In the Waterloo station scene, we see various aspects of the railway station's spatial morphology, including shops and vendors, such as the telephone seller Jason Bourne buys his disposable phone from, billboard advertising, such as for British Telecom, several exit and entrance signs, as well as directions to train platforms in bold lettering. There is also the ubiquitous presence of CCTV cameras that we are frequently meant to notice as a way of keeping in view the fact that the scene we are watching on our screens is also being closely observed from the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. The railway station scene also conforms to Bakhtin's definition of the chronotope. And as in what we saw from our discussion of the airport chronotope a couple of weeks ago, the railway station is predominantly a chronotope of disaggregation that also contains spaces of sporadic and temporary aggregation, such as cafes, eating places, waiting lobbies, and so on. Furthermore, the scene at Waterloo Station also establishes a dialectical relationship between transparency and opacity. Transparency shows itself in two ways. First is in the fact that all aspects of the spatial morphology of the railway station are supposed to be self-explanatory and clear for users of the station. Second is that transparency in this case is also partly an assumed projection of the spies in the monitoring office at CIA headquarters from where the surveillance apparatus is designed to render everything completely self-evident and clear to them as though they themselves were potential users of the railway station but of course, for different surveillance purposes. And yet, at the same time, the assumed transparency of the scene is shadowed by its opposite, seen in the ways in which Jason Bourne converts the space of the railway station 
into an enigmatic labyrinth so as to systematically evade the CCTV cameras in the station and, by extension, the gaze of the operatives at the CIA headquarters, who he knows have their eyes on the station. What Bond does then is to hijack the codes of transparency of the banal space of the railway station and to turn them into those of opacity, thus forcing the CIA to doubt and second guess every detail that is presented to them via the surveillance operators. They see only what unfolds in the scene, since as viewers, we are privy to both Bourne and Ross's perspectives, which they in Langley are not. And so, as the scene switches between the two locations, we can see what they in the CIA office are striving to uncover and how they are repeatedly frustrated in their attempts. They think they know everything, but they actually don't. And in this way, a series of structural ironies become part of the unfolding scene. Also important in the unfolding scene at Waterloo Station is that the camera keeps shaking unsteadily as if to mimic the intensifying pace of events from Bourne and Ross's perspectives. Thus also adding yet another tier of the conflicting relationship between transparency and opacity. The shaking camera serves to register the emotions that Jason Bourne and Simon Ross are experiencing from their personal perspectives, but transposed into the very character of the filming so that the camera is at once a recorder of their actions and a prosthesis of the anxious viewpoints. There are, however, some, some elements of the scene at Waterloo Station that hint at the fact of its complete and utter constructedness. At no point is the central principle of human circulation that informs the chronotope of disaggregation of the railway station ever impeded or even marginally slowed down. People keep behaving inside the station as if nothing at all is going on. Jason Bourne seems keen not to cause any obstruction to the flow of people heading in different directions inside of the busy terminal, because to do so would be to call immediate attention to himself. But his success at achieving this is premised on something slightly awry in the scene, and that is that despite the fact that he incapacitates at least one of the operatives in the full glare of the people at the railway station, no one seems to notice anything out of ordinary. Thus, despite the frenetic chase inside of the railway station scene and the sharp and erratic movements of the camera, the entire scene appears to be a stage set exclusively for the benefit of the surveillance apparatus back at the CIA headquarters in Langley, and not at all for the thronged passengers inside of Waterloo Station itself. Now, Waterloo Station is one of the busiest railway terminals in London, but the film converts the busy scene into what turns out to be a mere background to the unfolding uh, crisis of surveillance and counter surveillance generated by the CIA at Langley and Jason Bourne, respectively. The scene thus provides the background setting 
for the working out of the archetypal encounter between predator and prey, suitably augmented and complicated by the inversion of the relationship between transparency and opacity we noted a moment ago. It is only when, at the very end of the scene, we have been looking at Ross breaks out of hiding and runs through the station that he is shot by the assassin who has been commissioned to kill both him and Jason Bourne. The assassin had been hiding patiently behind a sliding advertising billboard that kept opening and closing right above the station. Bourne had been exposed briefly once before when beating up some of the operatives and gazing up to look directly at the camera in that corner of the station. But he still retained the power of opacity a few moments longer. However, the moment of Ross's death suddenly breaks the code of the arcane and labyrinthine hide and seek movements we have been privy to all along. So that the scene now coalesces into an ordinary scene of panic and chaos for everyone inside the railway station. But this also means that Bond's game is up and he's obliged to now track down the assassin and seek revenge. I have often wondered about something that is commonplace in the Jason Bourne movies and in all other spy and indeed crime thrillers I can think of. And that is how the uh, characters, the central characters run when they are being hotly pursued by their adversaries. Whether it is with Jason Bourne or Jack Reacher or, or Mission Impossible or in the James Bond uh, series, there are almost standard chase sequences that populate these movies. However, Jason Bourne or James Bond's running is not the same as how Usain Bolt runs. The central contrast between these two lies not in the fact that one is a spy inside a movie and the other is a celebrated sprinter and Olympic athlete. Rather, it is that Usain Bolt runs unerringly in a straight line and typically does not look to right or left so as not to break from the task of winning uh, at the end. Contrastively, the spy runs very fast, but keeps looking at everything in his path. This is because in the spy thriller movie, running requires a rapid and continuous assessment of any potential threats to the spy's life. The coming crossroads may reveal fresh and sudden threats, and every physical aspect of space and infrastructure being traversed may contain a booby trap of one kind or another. The point is that the spy thriller, unlike that of running 100 meters, shows running that requires a hermeneutical interpretation of space, even as the spy is desperate to escape his pursuers. This is so whether the chase is on foot, via different means of locomotion such as a car, a motor motorcycle, a bus, a helicopter, a boat, or all of these in a rapid sequence of changeability. One advantage of using a spy thriller such as the Bourne Ultimatum to establish an inquiry into spatiality and spatial relations is that it helps to illustrate to a really high degree the ways in which space is not merely a background to events, but is itself a subject that invites interpretation at different levels of complexity. 
Space is a hermeneutical object. The spy thriller movie makes subject to incessant interpretation, both by the spy and us, its viewers. But the spy thriller expresses the hermeneutics of, of, hermeneutics of space, both in terms of the conventions that govern that genre and from the point of view of its organizing chronotopes, in terms of shifting temporal and spatial indices. Thank you very much. Please remember to check the suggested reading in the episode description. And if you like this episode, give a thumbs up, subscribe and share, hit the notification bell so you do not miss any upcoming episodes and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.